We had a wonderful summer of having our presentation of Colors and Ple Pledge of Allegiance led by our ROTC, uh, but we are very excited to welcome back our students who help us open up every board meeting uh, throughout the school year. And today we have Mahosa Aradakunda from Harris Jackson Community Learning Center. So we'd like to welcome her. She is a fifth grader who attends Harris Jackson CLC. And since joining Harris Jackson Community at the end of her third grade year, she has been a bright spot and a great addition. One of her favorite things to do is help. Not only is she a great big sister and helper to her little brother, but she also helps other students who are learning English as a second language. Mahosa's fourth grade teacher described her as an absolutely sweet girl and a sponge for knowledge. She loves to learn. Coming to a brand new country and learning a new language has not discouraged Mahosa one bit. If she doesn't get something right the first time, she listens that much more closely and works that much harder and doesn't make the same mistake twice. As a fourth grader, Mahosa was selected from her class as the student of the month for her communication skills. How awesome is that? She was learning a new language and still excelled at listening, Amen. speaking, helping, and learning. And the Harris Jackson CLC family applauds Mahosa and they are proud to have her representing their community at the Board of Education and I should mention that unfortunately for um, Mahosa, there was a slight communication problem our, on our end, and she showed up at 5 o'clock this morning. Oh. So we are welcoming her back for the second time today. Um, so please help me welcome Mahosa to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. She's the very first Harris Jackson student to ever come to the board. That's right. All oh, right. We like that. She's from North Cluster. That's right. <laughs> and she and her family are from the Congo. Right. Yeah, nice. Can you tell us who you brought with you? Where today? is that at? Yeah. In Africa. Well, I know that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, that I didn't weird. Wear, like, she's. she's my husband's is going to tell us who she brought with us today. I'm here with my uncle Owens. And my name is Rosa, and I'm 10 years old, and, um, and I'm so excited to be here. We're excited to have you. Who did you bring with you from school? From school, uh, my uncle. You're always Oh, my, I brought here with my, uh, Principal and the Thompson. Thompson. Well, thank you for being here and for being such a great student. It was great to have you. And because we know Mahosa was up early this morning, <laughs> um, she does not have to stay if you guys would like to sneak out, uh, or you're more than welcome to stay and watch us conduct business. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Community and school reflection. I'll start, I guess. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot going on. I'm sure I'll cover a few things that all of us were are at. Um, one was the Project Grad uh, 15th Annual Breakfast, and uh, it was uh, a very nice breakfast. Uh, a lot of people this year support Project Grad. Um, it was Mr. Bravo and Mrs. Mansfield who was there uh, when I was there. I don't know if I, anyone else was there, but I, those two were there when I was there. And uh, our superintendent, Mr. James, uh, had an opportunity to speak about the program, and we also had our previous superintendent, Dr. Small, who had an opportunity to speak about at speak at the program. Uh, one of the things that was nice uh, that we are going to Project Grad is going to uh, work along with our Career Academy at North 
to combine and do some work there. And I thought that was really nice because Project Grad basically was in the Bukto cluster and now they're branching out to do some other good things. So it was nice to uh, uh, hear that. Uh, also, there was a young man and I didn't get his name who was a graduate from uh, Bukto Project Grad and he graduated from Moorhead State University as well. He is currently working at uh, Minority Behavioral Health and I can't remember his name and I didn't get it so I apologize, I'll have to get it later. But it was a nice event, good breakfast, a um, uh, lot of support there for Project Grad in the, in the program. And Jackie Silas Butler is doing an excellent job there with the program. Uh, also, uh, several of us, and I believe almost all of us, were uh, were there at the uh, Employee of Distinction <coughs> Luncheon, uh, and our own uh, Akron Public Schools Teacher of the Year was there, Mrs. Jill uh, Finnegan, fin Finnegan, I'm sorry, from King CLC, and she received some recognition for her uh, uh, being an outstanding teacher, and congrats to her because she's a very, very good teacher and loves the kids and has been, a, been around and continues to work. I also had opportunity to uh, uh, participate in a pancake breakfast at North High School. Uh, their girls basketball team hosted it, and so I stopped up there for a little while, and uh, they did a good job, Coach Meadows and Coach Q, as they call her, Coach Martin. Uh, they, they allowed the girls to cook. They did a very good job. I ate more than I probably should have that morning, but it was, it was good. They had pancakes. They had eggs. They had sausage. They had... Um, uh, orange juice, coffee, and water for everyone, and the food again was good. Uh, again, I had more, I probably had enough to eat for two days, but uh, I ate pretty well there. So, uh, and, the, and the young ladies did an outstanding job, so I want to uh, congratulate them for doing what they, they did there during the breakfast. I also had a chance to attend the uh, Bookdo St. V uh, football game on Saturday. It was very well attended. I uh, wanted to thank Joe Vassilotti as well because he was instrumental in helping to get a uh, new scoreboard there. And the scoreboard was nice. It looks uh, amazing, even the whole field looked nicer uh, just by having that new scoreboard there. And there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of individuals there from Kent State as well as the University of Akron. And there was a lot of shout outs to both, uh, both universities. So it was, it was nice, uh, it had a nice collaboration. Even though Bukto lost, uh, we hoped they would have won, but that's okay. They still played well, and, uh, but it was a very, very good uh, football game. So I had an opportunity to, to attend four different events uh, since our last board meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, on the 30th, I attended the Northeast Ohio OSBA regional meeting, and um, they now officially have within OSBA a grant fund so that they are actually funding the, the book scholarships and um, the book grants and things. And then um, they asked me to push on um, promoting participation in the Capitol Conference, and I talked to Mrs. Jijic, and we are in the middle of finalizing ours, but we're submitting six different groups to present at the Student Achievement Fair. Um, Nepali dancers, which, which should be pretty unique mm -hmm. to Akron. Um, the Operation Soapbox, um, a panel on the Academy from North, uh, the Freshman Teams Development, uh, possibly Wonder World with the international community, and a music group. So it hasn't been finalized, but we are definitely going to have a strong presence. So I, I was asked to make sure that happened, and I didn't really have to work hard since you did all that for me. So <laughs> I, will, I will make sure that they know that she gets the credit, not me. <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing, on the 31st, I did attend the summer-fall graduation um, and so we had 36 additional students graduate, which is exciting. It's nice to see them walk across the stage. And we had, I think we actually had somebody, someone from every school, uh, except maybe um, uh, Akron Auburn and Alternative Academy. But I think we had somebody, at least one from each, um, walk across. We, we had to talk a few into it, but we, we got them to walk across the stage. So that was a good sign, and it was a great event. And just one other thing on the um, Goodwill Employees of Distinction, that's the second year in a row we had one of our, our Teacher of the Year make the Goodwill finalists. So we have a great track record. Um, we have great teachers, so we do yes. <coughs> I had the opportunity to go to uh, King CLC's uh, IB program for the kindergartners, and uh, they were learning Spanish, and they were learning certain characteristics. Uh, the principal had a 
nice hat with all the different characteristics that they're supposed to have, confidence, uh, compassion for one another, etc. Uh, in fact, she's supposed to be making me one, so I think I have to wear it <laughs> next time we, we meet. Uh, but they uh, enjoy themselves. I think we have four uh, classes of kindergartners there, and a good size, about 20 per class. Uh, so they were doing very well. I happened to be on vacation, and I went to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, and while there, I met one of their outstanding teachers who uh, was teaching for some 20 plus years uh, with the students there and who was actively involved or knew of the members who were involved in Q. Uh, so uh, we were able to bridge uh, and have some communication and fellowship there and talk about even while on vacation, you know, some little bit about education and about uh, uh, Q and, and uh, they have good representation. I think even yes. one of the persons on the executive board, yes. apologize, uh, of Q that's from the Virgin Islands. And I just got out <laughs> in time. Yes. Okay, that was one of the last flights out before the hurricane came in. Uh, but uh, it was a great experience talking to the teacher there. Um, I, in addition to several of the things that have been mentioned already, I had the pleasure of representing the board um, at a lunch for, by, held by the Flying Jays. And that, those are uh, ladies from Jackson, um, former um, PTA presidents, a few staff from the old Jackson school who had contacted me um, before the board changed the name of the school from Harris to Harris Jackson. And they wanted to have me come on behalf of the board to um, take thanks for that. And it was, it was wonderful to see um, their dedication to not just the new school, which they're incredibly excited about, and thank all of us very much for that, but for the addition to the neighborhood and how they feel that they want to welcome um, the, the school back. So they were very excited. And even though it was the very first day for the kindergartners, um, our lovely principal didn't mind that I brought them up <laughs> on the very first day. And we, we were there for dismissal, which can be a little crazy on <coughs> any day of the week, but um, especially when you're picking up your baby from kindergarten. And I can tell you that honestly, within 10 or 15 minutes of the final bell, there wasn't a student left in the parking lot. Everyone had been picked up. It was a little hectic. But if in 10 or 15 minutes everyone has found who they're supposed to find and everyone's been loaded on a bus and is out of there, I would just encourage patient, patients across the district. The first 10 days or so, everyone is still sorting all of this out. The, the thing is, by the time we get to the end of the year, there are a couple things that we do so well by the end, we forget what the beginning is like. And when we start all over again, there's always these hiccups. We've got streets closed all over the place. Poor Deborah, I don't know how you're getting people to where they're getting, because every day I drive to work, there's a new road closed. Um, so I asked for patience for, from the parents, but um, we were up there and we walked around the new building again, and their eyes were just huge. They, they love the space, especially the library and the art room. They're very excited about possibly getting their hands on uh, on coming in there for some community meetings. So um, look forward to that, the Harris Jackson staff, because they are dynamos. And then on, um, I got to attend uh, open house at Firestone and, and speak to some of the staff there and, and get a chance to walk around the building as a parent and a board member. So thanks to the parents who I talked to there. And on a sad note, I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention this to Marilyn, um, I went to calling hours for a former coach at North High School, um, Coach Mary Cooper. Um, she was not only my gym teacher, but she also took a kid who was pretty shy and uninvolved and made her scorekeeper for the volleyball team and the softball team and kept me involved. Uh, she and Yvonne Humphreys also gave my husband his first job in broadcasting. He was allowed, to, they, I, I think Yvonne took money out of her own pocket to give him $5 to allow him to announce the volleyball games. <laughs> so um, we got to sit side by side, so they did a little matchmaking there as well. So um, 
she she passed away uh, about two weeks ago, and there was a large representation um, there of our schools and her former um, teammates who came. She had several um, city series champion volleyball and softball um, seasons. So she will be missed, and she made a huge impact on my life. This was a very, very, very good teacher. Yes, she was. When I, was in North as well. I was not her she best was. gym student, but. <laughs> <laughs> she was a very, very good, dedicated yeah. teacher. Very dedicated. Um, pretty much everything I did has already been mentioned, but I did want to uh, make a personal invite. I think everybody was invited to this, but this coming Thursday, Christ Child Society is having an open house at their warehouse, and it's that. It's just an open house. Stop by, see what they're doing, see how they help the Akron Public Schools. Uh, full disclosure, my wife's very involved in that. She's got uniforms for about 80 kids in her car right now that will be distributed tomorrow, but uh, they would love for everybody to come out and just briefly, if you don't know what Christ Child Society is, they, one of the many things that they do, they, they provide free school uniforms for uh, grade school students. And um, it's just a great, uh, great thing for our school district. And if there's a teacher out there that has a student that needs a uniform for school, clothes for school, all they have to do is go to their counselors uh, and or the principal in that building, they'll reach out to Christ Child Society and they will deliver for free to the school, straight to the school building. So if you can come out four to seven, like I said, I believe the calendar invite went out to everybody in the district, but uh, just make a pit stop and see what they're doing for us. Very good organization. <coughs> Anyone else? To keep things moving later, I'm going to go ahead and, and do mine now. I want to say welcome back to school again for the first uh, full week of school and as Lisa said I would just encourage patience and understanding um, for all of the, the hiccups that we have now and again uh, there are so many things that are going well uh, to the start of the year um, so we're really excited and really thankful to all of our administrative staff and faculty for all of the hard work that they put in to put 21,000 students back in the classroom back to school and again, for all of the hiccups, uh, with with really very very little uh, commotion going on, we have heard from from staff and want them to know that we hear their concerns on on the crowding and class sizes and, and craziness going on there. Uh, but again, as we kind of work through these first couple of weeks, we've had conversations with the superintendent and assistant superintendent, and these are things that. I think, as Lisa said, we get to the end of the year and things are going so well and there are so many things that we do right that I think we forget about how crazy the beginning of the year can be. Um, but we've heard you and, and we've heard from the community on our hiccups with maybe lunch the first couple of days. So we will work on that for next year. Um, we appreciate all the feedback. That's what we're here for. We want to hear from you and know what's working and what's not and how we can do uh, better because we're here for not um, you know, not, not just the kids, not just the teachers, but everyone. We're here to, to figure out what we can do and how we can make your life a bit easier as you do so much for our students. So thank you. Welcome back to everyone. Um, and uh, with that, um, I also attended the summer fall graduation of Bookdoll, um, the Project Grad Breakfast and the Employee of Distinction Luncheon. I do want to say that I also attended for the first time um, the Firestone Marching Band preview, which I thought meant I was just going to go and preview the marching band, but in fact they paired us up with students and then taught us how to march and we marched well into the evening. <laughs> it was pretty dark by the time we left and I had the little ding, 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 ding stuck in my head. Um, but yeah, we were out there marching. Lisa, you know, thanks for the warning. <laughs> I thought I was just going to be watching. Um, also, really enjoyed seeing the community come out in Kenmore uh, last weekend for not just for the Kenmore Better Block, but on Friday we did the send off for the new Kenmore Garfield football team. And we lined the streets with people on both sides of the street who as the buses came around, as they were leaving Kenmore to go to their first away game, uh, the community came out and cheered them on as they, as they left. And I did hear back 
that the, that the students really appreciated that and kind of didn't know what to think when they kind of pulled around the corner in the streets just lined with people on both sides. So that was really exciting. And the Kenmore Better Block itself was just a testament to everything that's going on in that neighborhood and uh, the attention that it's uh, getting that it deserves right now. So I uh, really enjoyed uh, the Kenmore Better Block. Uh, Tim and I, I know Jackie Silas Butler was there, I know Councilman Neal was there, there were a few other people, did the Bookdale clap-in on Tuesday the 5th. We were invited to participate in the clap-in for the students uh, with the DJ and the music and the fog <coughs> machine and the red carpet. And so, I mean, you know, they literally rolled out the red carpet for the students and that was a lot of fun. Uh, to see most of the students did not want to come in the building. <laughs> did not. I think they were excited once they got in there. It was fun to watch the ones that kind of played it up a little bit, uh, but most of them kind of wondered what all these crazy adults were doing. Um, but that was a good time. Also, and, and then I toured, um, Tim and I toured uh, some buildings with our AEA reps on last week. Last week. Um, two or three buildings just to see uh, how things were going the, the first, um, uh, the first well, not really the first week back to school, but the first week that all the students were, were kind of back to school. Um, and again, saw so many great things going on, so many kids that were excited to be back, and, and the buildings looked great. Um, so lots of props to our custodial staff and everything for everything that they did to get the buildings ready to go. I mean, it was really just a wonderful thing, a wonderful day to, to visit buildings. I think that is it for me. I did attend the Ward 4 and Ward 9 meetings. Had, uh, there was an interesting conversation in Ward 4 about <coughs> the current initiative in front of Akron City Council right now to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I did have lots of great information on hand, thanks to Andrew. Adam Motter. Adam Motter. Andrew Adam, Adam Motter. I will get that right. Uh, because I owe him some thanks, because I have had some questions separately, but thankfully I was not asked to get up and say anything about what we do. Um, that's a very touchy, uh, very emotional subject for many people, um, but it was a really good conversation on both sides, uh, so I enjoyed uh, being a part of that. Anything else? Chris, I'm sorry, I left one thing out. I did also attend yesterday at Hardesty Park. It was called the Family uh, Black Pride event, which is at Hardesty Park, and uh, it was sponsored by the Akron AIDS Collaboration. It was a picnic that they had music, they had dancing, they had free food, they had vendors out. Uh, there's information on the issues that are going on, issue two rather, that's going on uh, in the city. So there was a lot of good things that were going on. They had uh, the African dancers with the drums. Of course, I like the drums, they sound really good. Uh, but they, it was a really nice uh, picnic, well attended, and uh, a lot of good people. So I was, I was glad to, to be able to attend that. Someone sent that to me at the last minute, but I was glad I went. Because it was it was fun, so I want to mention that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> Hearing none, we have no request to address the board, but we do have a presentation tonight on graduation requirements and our preliminary report card results. So with that. <clears throat> Uh, tonight, um, Mr. Black and I are actually going to tag team this presentation. Um, and this is the time of year that we give you kind of the first preview of what our state report card data is going to look like. The official report cards aren't released until Thursday. Um, so it's not official until the state releases them, but we've taken a look at some of the preliminary data and we're going to share that with you uh, tonight. We're going to actually cover two um, topics tonight, all related to where this high quality instruction, um, gearing up towards these results that we're focused on which is the uh, graduation rate, 21st century skills, and meeting uh, the <coughs> expectations for being able to walk right into a college of their choice or a career. So we'll be reporting on those pieces tonight. Uh, we're going to go through report card data 
um, and some of our own district data. As you all know, we have our own district measures that have been more consistent over time. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of that, as well as the district report card data. And then Mr. Black is going to come up and dive in specifically into graduation results and looking at what the state has done because of the statewide concern that so few students were meeting the new graduation requirements. You all passed a board policy last time that came from uh, Mr. Alexander. And tonight we're here to actually talk about the data and talk to you about where we're going with the new class of 2018 graduation requirements. So we'll dive into that and then talk a little bit about the next steps of the report card uh, rollout with exactly what will happen on Thursday and then after that. We actually got the value added data last night, was released from the state. So this is fresh. If you see any emails that were coming at 2 o'clock in the morning from me, that was from me. I was still working trying to analyze uh, that data. That data. So uh, let me remind you and kind of step you back to last year at this time. It was almost the same exact day. We were uh, talking about the new report card because the new report card uh, had two major changes to it. It had new report card measures and new tests. And so I used the example that really we were comparing apples <coughs> to bananas at that point because the data was completely different with different tests and different uh, report card measures because they had made dramatic changes. And then in the middle I said, but we do have district data that we called the oranges that were consistent all the way from 2013 to 16 that we can look at that data. So kind of despite the changes in the state data, at least we have really relied more on our own district data because we've got multiple years of the same sources. Tonight, I'm actually uh, going to do something similar. These were the changes last year. Uh, third year in a row, if you remember the changes in the testing. So now we've actually had two years of consistent state tests. It was the first year, last two years ago, for the online assessment and the changes. So here's how I describe this year. <laughs> this year, we have the bananas that I showed you last year, and we have kind of a combination of bananas and peaches this year. Some data is the same and a consistent measure, but they made some changes again. And then again, we have our orange is in the middle. Now we have data that's consistent from 2013 to 17 that I'll share with you tonight. So I can't say that they, they didn't touch the report card because they did. They still made changes in it that have been kind of a multi-year phase in. Here's the, the changes. Now on the report card, there's no reference whatsoever to the old OGT indicators. That's gone now. There were just a few students left in that senior year who were still under the OGT, but that is nowhere on the report card. Value added only, they're using two years of data instead of what uh, is really recommended for the three years of data. If you remember, the state suspended all use of value added data because they kept changing the tests. Well, now we do have two years' worth of data that we'll show you tonight. And then the tough thing for us is when the targets are still increasing. From last year to this year, four different indicators on the report card, the targets increased. So you may in, your, your achievement may increase, but the bar is higher on uh, the total number of indicators met, it's all now up to 80%. The gifted indicator prepared for success is like the ACT and things like that. And uh, the gap closure measure, those four moved up. Um, so that's why you get half a banana and half a peach kind of blended uh, because the report card change. But we do have our map data that is consistent that I can show you tonight from 2013 through 2017. It doesn't make it any easier, though, with the report card. Because as you know, 
That is what we're under, although it's very complicated to communicate this out to the public and explain how uh, these measures change. So here's where we are. Here's kind of this Apple category in 1516. And then last year, I showed you that 1617, and then this year. The first two categories are obviously the greatest news for us, is that uh, last year I talked to you about how we were seeing for the first time in those early elementary grades that students were ending the year reading on grade level or, or a hair away from being on grade level. And we're seeing now in K-3 literacy that progress is continuing, uh, that we're seeing that increase in the K-3 literacy because we've moved all the way up to a C. Uh, under Mary Kelly's leadership over there, the humble leadership of Mary Kelly over there, our third grade guarantee, we hit 99% uh, of promoting students on to third grade after incredibly intensive reading uh, intervention during the year and having nearly one-to-one -one type of intervention plus summer school where we continue to work with students, we ended up with 99% of the students moving forward. And that is no one competes with us in this area across especially the uh, large urban districts across the state and many suburban districts. We do a beautiful job with that. Then when you move down, here's where we struggle to hit the indicators. Two things, <coughs> when you think about the report card, what's happened over these years is two major things. The assessments have gotten tougher and the bar has been raised simultaneously. So our gap, actually has gotten bigger over that time period. So the tests have gotten harder. Last year, the state warned all districts that you'll probably lose uh, two, an average of two grades on the report card. Across the state, that's what happened because the tests were harder. And then they've increased the cut score to get to 80% now which the, that results in gaps for us. So that's the tough part. That's the tough part for us to be under those requirements, and it's a tough part to continue to try to close those gaps when the bars keep moving, but we have to. Uh, last year I explained that this year was gonna be sort of a new baseline for us to now set the trajectory. Uh, five years ago, our proficiency in achievement, our proficiency, we were ranging uh, third grade through 10th grade. We were somewhere between uh, mid 50% proficiency in reading and math, all the way up to 80% in high school. Now with the new tests, we are down to a range between generally 25% proficiency to 60%. So you can see kind of a 20 point drop is where now our new baseline is when we have to get to 80 percent okay that's the tough reality that these incredible people across the room uh, deal with every single day that 20 to 30 point drop and we're starting over basically it feels like we're starting over it actually feels like I've been in the district this is my 30th year it feels like where we were about 20 years ago, where we had to start that, that trajectory that we've been on, and now we dropped 20 points, and now we're starting over again. Okay? It doesn't make it any easier for us every day. So here's where, when we just dive into that achievement, so even though all the scores with the new tests that came last year that dropped down that 20 uh, to 25 point drop, from last year to this year, we've seen these kind of increases. So we are on that trajectory back up, given hopefully that, that I will see us back to where we started 
before I retire from this district is my goal since I'm in my 30th year. The goal is for this team to be able to get us back up uh, to uh, where we were hitting those indicators at 80% like we used to. Uh, you, you remember most of the high school indicators we hit back in, in uh, under the old tests, under the old uh, OGT and even before then the Ohio proficiency test. So we saw, the good news is we saw these increases, which are very strong increases in reading. At the high school, here's one major, uh, major cautionary note, and the state knows that this is a problem. At the high school, under the old report card, they only had on the indicator the kids who took the test for the first time. They took the OGT for the first time, and then that was reported out. Under this new report card this year with new measures, they took these new tests, and anyone who took the test for the first time is in the data, and any student who retook it again because they scored low the first time, their results are in this report card measure. So if you think about that just for a second, that means, again, we're comparing apples and oranges. It's kids who took the test for the first time plus the lowest performing kids who retake it because they want to increase their score. All their scores are dumped in there too. That's not a good thing to do measurement-wise, uh, obviously, to put those retakes in there too because I can't report to you exactly how we're doing based on the report card uh, because there's these uh, second and third attempt scores that are included in those results. The state is going to change that. We've already had a phone conference with them and they pledged to change that for next year's report card. But for this year, know that any high school result, you're looking at the first time kids took the test and every time they've retaken the test, that score also got added in, which tends to be lower scores. If you, you know, the kids who are retaking it are the kids who scored low. So in essence, one kid could have three scores in that average yes. thing? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah, they, under the old report card, they separated that out. We had a 10th grade OGT, then we had 11th grade OGT, so the retakes were separate. For some reason, they combined them, and they know on the phone conference, the Ohio Aid had a phone conference, and they all said, we know it's a problem, we shouldn't have done it, and we're going to work with the U.S. Department of Ed to separate it out next year. So we only, should see that. I'm sorry, is that the only area they're going to change the report card, that, that, uh, those two? Just the high school, and the same right. thing for math and science and social studies. Any high school exam, and you'll see that when we come to... So here's where we are for reading and English language arts. Here's math. We have some strong increases, again, from elementary, and then some in middle, and then uh, high school, again, this is retake. So uh, our Howard Lawson is working to carve out those retakes so we know where we are. But it's not going to show up on the report card separate. It'll be combined. And then finally, for science and social studies, the increases, American government uh, had a large increase. Can we change how we give that class as yeah. well? Isn't that what? Mm -hmm. right. So the summary then is 82% of our elementary grade levels and subjects improved. So we have to be happy about that. That's this trajectory that we're saying, especially when we're seeing from elementary, the more we get kids reading on grade level, the more we're seeing that, that change, right, continue to improve that middle school performance and then high school performance. And then the middle school, it was 50%, uh, which was not good enough for us, and we're going to work very carefully to get that also at the same kind of trajectory as the elementary. And then this is where uh, we're going to have to report this out to you later once we are able to separate out those scores because it's difficult to compare the retakes. I'm going to have 
Mark come up and he's going to show you more detailed graduation um, because what's happened across the state is there's sort of a graduation emergency happening across the state that Mark is going to give you some data on that so that we can look at how the state is adjusting for the class of 2018. You want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Just, just so you guys know, if you can remember that slide that Ellen showed a little bit ago, well, about a couple seconds ago with the American government being at 18 plus, just know American government is our subject that does not get retaken a lot. So that was really students taking it one time. It comes later in the high school career, comes in their junior year, and they only take it once. So that was pretty much pure data right there. So you, you're able to see how our students do the first time on that. Um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna um, quickly look at this slide right here, 7, 18, 21. And Mr. James said that he will give a $50 gift card to anyone that can tell us what 7, 18, 21 <laughs> means. And you cannot be a principal or anyone on a senior staff. 7, 18, 21, anyone wanna take a shot at it? Because we all got to start understanding 7, 18, 21. Anyone? Want to take a shot? Right. $50 gift card. No, it's right. graduation requirements. Okay. So that's a start. Okay. Seven end of course exams. Seven end of course exams. Okay, good. 18 points. 18 points. 21 credits. 21 credits. Bravo gets $50 gift card, Mr. James. He <laughs> <laughs> gets the gift card. And we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail because what's happening is there are some changes that have taken place with the class of 2018, but yes, um, if we are really, and I know we are, but if we're really serious about enrolled, employed in the list, we got to make sure that we ring that 7, 18, 21 every time we're interacting with community members, every time we're interacting with students, parents, um, businesses, so forth and so on, because we got to make sure our students are taking the 7 end of the course exam so that we get a score. And I don't care if they're at the third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, because what happens is the more you take it, it also gives a true projection of what the student is supposed to score over time. So when you do value added, it's not just over the year in high school. It's from your third grade year all the way to your 10th grade year. Every test that you've ever taken, all total together to say, hey, Mark Black is supposed to score a four and it's for the buildings and the, the teachers to make sure that Mark scores that four so that the value added scores are good and also Mark gets that projection towards his ACT and it's correct. So when we have uh, parents or students choosing not to take a test, that's taken away from that projection of where they're supposed to be on prepare for success and for the value added. So the details behind the 7, 18, 21 is Here's the seven courses, Algebra 1, Biology, English 9, English 10, uh, Geometry, U.S. Government, and U.S. History. Uh, algebra, uh, and, it's, and it's when the student takes the test. Now here's a change for our district, and I'll just use um, Litchfield for example, because we just met with some parents from Litchfield. Um, there are students that took Algebra 1 in the seventh grade. They scored a 2 on the end of the course exam, which means that they didn't score proficient, <coughs> So technically, they have to start retaking. So now when we have parents uh, allowing for their students to take course, high school courses early in their middle school years, we have to make sure that they understand the supports and the needs that go with taking that course so that their student is getting a score that's going to be transcripted as proficient and their student on track to graduate. Um, and with the 18 points, students earn one to five points per exam based on performance. You'll see a slide later that breaks down that five uh, all the way down to one. And then the 21 course credits, you've got to have four years of English, four years of math, algebra two included in that math, three years of science, um, lab science included in there, three social studies, American government, and U.S. history um, have to satisfy that, and then a half of health, half of physical education, and six electives. So with that, Here's what our, our OST points would look like. So this is a student. The four that you see next to the English, the two that you see next to the Algebra 1 Geometry, and the points over there 
for biology of American history, American government, kind of speaks towards this 54321. And the reason why I showed you this is because a student that has a two, technically in English and math, you know, that automatically generates a retake, okay, if they want to take advantage of um, some added options, and I'll show you those later. So if I am a student, as Ellen explained earlier, and I'm taking Algebra 1 um, in my ninth grade year, I get a chance to take it, but then if I score a 2, I retake it when I'm retaking my, my geometry in my sophomore year, I'm counted towards geometry and I'm counted towards Algebra 1 based on that rescore. If I am a student in English that scores a four, and I say, man, I, I'm one point away from getting a perfect, all right, or getting a five, I want to retake it to get a five, my score does not count, okay? So if I score a four and I retake English and score a five, that five does not recount in the district's data. It only recounts for a student that scores a one or two from the first time taking it. Maybe you guys aren't hearing here because I'm a little ticked off by that, right? <laughs> right? Because that's telling me that if I'm a high achieving student, if I score a three, four, or five, my score doesn't count back if I improve it. But if I'm a student that scores a one or two, my score will count back if I improve it or not improve it, okay? So that's the issue we have with the retesting. All right, and then this is the details for the 21 credits. We've already broke those down, just so you guys can see them in here. And then the supports, because you, you, you want to know, well, what are you doing to prepare our students? Well, the first thing we're doing for the seven OSTs is we're making sure that our curriculum guides, our curriculum pathways, our course sequences are aligned um, to the standards that we're given within the classroom, um, the standard, standardized tests we're given within the classroom based on the standards that have been set uh, through the Common Core. Um, we're making sure that our technology integration supports those standards and those um, supports that we have within our class. So what we've done is we've created math and English modules that supports the OST testing style. So if a student's retaking a class because they failed a credit, so I got an F in Algebra 1, I got to retake the course, I'm retaking the course through the lens of preparing to be uh, proficient on the end of the course exam. Okay? So that's what uh, Karen Jijic and her uh, team, her teaching and learning team, has put in place in collaboration with Howard and his team, making sure that when we're rolling out this technology, we're making sure that it's aligned to the way that a student has to sit down and take a, a test on the computer, okay? Real-time intervention, OST prep, after-school intervention are all things um, you know, that's allowing us to reshape our learning conditions. So when you think of this right here, this goes towards our high-quality instruction. When you think of this middle one right here, it's us setting our learning conditions to make sure the students are successful, and then how we're collaborating with the parents when a student has to do credit recovery online courses or go to night school, we bring the parents in, sit down, we generate a contract with the students and the parents and, and try to help them, A, prevent them from paying for you know, night school and try to do things during the school day or after school so that their students are getting um, the necessary interventions to stay on track to graduate. So from these supports, what do we look like now? Here's what we look like. We had 92% of our students take the seven end of the course exams. So we have 8% of our students, and some of those were no-shows to our, to our district, um, students that we could not locate um, are, are in that 92%, uh, in that 8%, but 92% of our students took the end of the course exam. 64% of them um, earned a 15 or more, which means that some have to retake to get up to the 18. We have 85% of our students on track uh, with 14 or more credits to graduate <coughs> one time. Uh, for, for us in our district, 14 or more credits going into your senior year uh, marks you as on track to graduate. Uh, 15 or more points on the OST marks you as on track to graduate. So when we look at that 64%, that's what sparked the school, I mean, I'm sorry, sparked the state to look at some alternative pathways for our students, and we'll discuss those here. So here's what we've covered so far. But when you look at this, the state put out some alternative pathways. Students could use industry credentials and workforce readiness, which is the work keys. They had to score 12 or higher on the work keys, 13 now, and, and to get an industry credential. 
College and Career Readiness Test for ACT and ACT, meaning they had to score 18 in the areas of English, 22 in math, 22 in reading, in order to qualify for that. And then there was some additional options to earn a high school diploma for the class of 2018 we'll talk about. The reason why these were sort of unfair, because if I can't score proficient on the <coughs> OST, how can I sit on an ACT and score a readiness score, which is a more rigorous test? Um, so when you look at this second to last bullet here, additional options, um, Mr. James was, was very instrumental in going to work with not only the big eight superintendents, but going down and working with um, the Ohio Department of Education and their board to put some things in place that was fair and equitable for all students that went beyond the overall graduation points, the remediation pre-score, and the industry credential. And here's what they are. The alternative pathway. As a student in the class of 2018 only, right now, class of 2018 only, if I do not have 18 points on the OST and I've completed all required high school courses, I've taken all required end of the course exams, and I did a retake, if I scored a one or two in English and math, I then can meet two of these requirements here. And these two requirements are very reasonable. They're things that we monitor already in our district. Um, Howard and his team have created ways for us to check to see how students are meeting 93% um, attendance rate during their senior year have a 2.5 senior year GPA. So these two right here, if I can meet those two and I have not met the 18 points, I can receive a diploma, okay? Um, capstone Senior Project, defined by the district, which goes in line with what we're doing with our college and career academies. With our academies, we have students that'll have to create and complete capstones. Um, through most of our work programs, we have students that have to do capstones and earn 120 hours. So these nine requirements, we feel that we're on track for our students to be able to meet two of these um, to replace the 18 points of falling short of the 18 points. And again, this is only in place for the class of 2018. So that you guys know how we look at our graduation steps, remember our ultimate goal is 93% um, for our, for our graduating class, the average of 93%. If you look at this right here, graduation rate in APS all four years of high school, what that means is um, Bruce Alexander entered North High School, he stayed there for four years, he has an 86% chance to graduate. When we disaggregate our data, that's what we find. If a student starts at our high school and stays in our high school without moving away, going to a charter, going to another school across town. If they stay in the school they start with, we have an 86% graduation rate with those students. If a student um, stays all four years and they need an extra year, we have a 79.5%. That's the help and support of our AAA program that we have over at the old reading or building. And then students that come in and out of our district. So uh, Lisa Mansfield started at North, but she went to Firestone, then came back to North, and then decided she may want to go to a charter school, and then came back to North. Students that move like that, we have a 73.1%, okay? So the message that our board members and our community members, if they receive anything from this presentation, stay in the school you start at, and you have a better chance of graduating, and you have a higher chance of graduating, okay? And then these are our um, results that we're looking for. You know, with Howard's work with his department, you know, getting technology to all of our students so that the students are interacting with technology and building their 21st century skills. You know, with our One the World initiative, with the 93% or higher graduation rate, we have committees that we're working with, especially in the North Cluster because we have the high refugee. We have students that come to us that's 17 and they've only completed seven years of school but because they, they've been in a refugee camp. We are creating um, how we onboard those students so that they're on track or we get them on track to meet our graduation requirements. Meeting admission criteria for college with work ready skills, that's what we're using. We partner with SEI. We'll be giving all of our junior students and sophomore students a practice ACT 
taking their data and putting in supports within each building for the students based on the gaps and the weaknesses that we're finding from that pre-ACT so that when they get into uh, the senior, I mean, I'm sorry, the spring of their uh, junior year, they have worked and prepared themselves to overcome any challenges of the ACT. And with our partners that we have with community members, we're steadily um, inform, um, making, our, making sure our students are informed and engaged citizens. Okay? So we'll pause there. Stay up here, Mr. Black. We'll pause there just on these uh, graduation requirements. Only for the class of 2018. I want to make sure everybody understands this is the state uh, superintendent convened a work group that our superintendent served on because they were so concerned. They were seeing basically across the state, not in the Ekin Public Schools, across the state, they were seeing around 65% potentially of the kids graduating. And that scared them, obviously. Um, so they put just for this year this stopgap measure, and then by January they're going to decide if any of those opportunities continue for the next class. Uh, and they're going to decide by January whether that continues. Yeah. Um, well, just a comment and then a question. The comment is I think that also goes to show that in some way, uh, maybe arbitrary is not the right word, but in some ways how arbitrary those lines are. Uh, because if you implement something and then you go, oh, but only 65% of our students across the entire state are going to graduate, we better, we better walk that back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it just goes to show how arbitrary that is. Yeah. I, you know, I think this board has continued in the six years that I've been on there to not only challenge the district, but also to support where we can. That, and I think we get it. And you said it best. I think it's difficult to, it's difficult to swallow. It's difficult to report on. It's difficult to go out and talk about when we go out to the community and you see D's and F's all over the place. But to keep in mind, one that in some ways there is a little bit of arbitrariness. There is a the lines here, and you're doing really well. Great job we're going to move the bar here. So we start to move up, and then they say, and we're going to move it here. And we keep moving up, and they're going to move it here. And we're constantly chasing, but our kids haven't really changed over the years. Our staff haven't really changed. And if either of them have, it's probably for the better. Yeah, I was um, going to say, they actually have, though. They've been making progress underneath that. So, the, yeah. so, and so that's enough of my statement, my yeah. soapbox. But on the question side, you said for 2018 only, so what is the state well, is the state going to reevaluate at the end of this year that well, actually starting in October they're going to get a team together again yeah. uh, like superintendents like Mr. James and uh, they'll bring back to their cabinet members you know ideas suggestions for the class of 2019 uh, the first thing they want to do is see the data for the class of 2019 how many of them have an 18 or, or higher right now and what does the projected graduation rate looks look like for them so we'll be doing the same thing that we did for the class of 2018, and then they'll take a look and see what. And if they're not comfortable, then they'll, they'll probably again. say we'll do one more year. Here's one of the other factors, and uh, the superintendent can probably weigh in on this a little bit. It's not just the low scores. I mean, because we're talking about suburban districts that all of a sudden they're used to 98% of their students graduating, and all of a sudden they were seeing 70% of the kids on track. So. It was across the board, yeah. but the other movement that's happening because of a lot of uh, feedback from parents and staff and board members is this pushback against only looking at kids' value based on test scores and that what is that really producing these college and career ready students or is it more important to be looking at capstone projects where they actually have to do research and projects and, and integrate with business community leaders and present their evidence at the end? Is work hours, is that really more important for us if a student has 120, 180, 250 work hours, is that really producing a more college and career ready student coming out the door? Our state superintendent, our governor, 
Ryan Burgess, who uh, the superintendent is pre presenting tomorrow to, who's the head of the Workforce uh, Development Office and the Governor's Office, they see more of this whole child for college and career readiness versus just test scores. That doesn't tell you how uh, prepared the student is. Yeah, so on the committee when we were meeting uh, last year, it wasn't just superintendents, but it was counselors, a representative of the Ohio Business Roundtable, and the conversation was really not so much about, you know, every kid going to college, but kids graduating with work-ready skills and how important that is, um, you know, not just for the kids, but the industry as well. So they were trying to strike a balance between just a strict look at test scores, but to look at a more um, well-rounded graduate and to give these students a chance who may, you know, I mean, I was talking with the president of the state school board who was sitting right next to me talking about, you know, her experiences with her kids and the expectations and, you know, some of the things that, um, you know, uh, I believe it was her son was going through in terms of completing high school and then facing these tests and saying, well, you know, he may want to have some other avenues of interest post high school. What we're very excited about when you look at this list, and I'm sure our superintendent had nothing to do with this list, but if you look at this, for those of you who've been very intimately involved in our College and Career Academy planning, these are the things that we already had built into the College and Career Academies under Ms. Decca's leadership, the capstone projects. We were going to make that automatic, that students had to go through a capstone project. There had to be service learning hours. That's Mr. Miller, that's your pride and joy of building in service learning hours. So when we saw this list starting to emerge, this is exactly in alignment with our college and career academies. We just have to make sure this continues beyond the class of 2018, most importantly. Other questions? Just, just for mm -hmm. clarification, so those, the VENs, which I think Mark said there were nine of them, those came from the state. Those weren't crafted by Akron Public Schools for Akron Public Schools. Well, that's correct. Right. There These was are input, state. I get it. But yes. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. These are state, state approved. State okay. approved list of nine conditions. Mm -hmm. And you have to meet two of those. So we're, our team is now building, uh, making sure that all of our students who still are at risk of hitting that 18 points can meet the two of these nine. I just have a comment. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we have something like that for our students because too many times we have students who are very bright who, who can uh, go out in the world and be very successful, but because they didn't reach a certain point on a test, then they, they are held back. And so we've hurt our kids in the past. Uh, uh, we've hurt our, our economy. We've hurt our, you know, everything because those kids haven't had opportunity. Because there are a lot of bright kids who can do a lot, but because they haven't Past that test. So I'm glad that we have this for these this this, this, this group of exactly kids that are coming out. This is exactly what our business partners are telling us when they created the portrait of a graduate. Right. They said these are the types of experiences that you need to build in right. for your students. I think that's important. Yeah, I want to but thank uh, Ms. Jijic's department, Joan Isaac, and then Mark Williams's department um, for getting this. This was a quick turnaround to get this communication. You guys seen this before, but we had to edit it and update it and add those options in. So now that you've heard it, starting tomorrow, you know these will go out to our buildings so that they can start having their parent conversations uh, with, with, and, and student conversations around the changes for the class of 2018. So if you could take one last round to everybody. So the final uh, few slides here before uh, Mr. Black and I close is now I want to show you, we looked at the report card data, but now I want to sh go kind of to the oranges in the middle on what is our consistent data that I can report out to you tonight from 2013 through 2017 in terms of our uh, growth. This is um, elementary reading improvements. Now I need to have you change your uh, brain a little bit here, just on these next few slides, um, that what we're looking at is not percentage of passage rate. These are called percentiles. This important term over here, with 50th percentile, 
is the being straight on grade level. If you're in the 50th percentile, you are right on grade level. It's actually from, uh, it's about 35 to 37 percent up to about 70 is really solid on grade level. Um, so that range is where you're shooting for. If you're in the 99th percentile, you are gifted and you should be probably in college by the time you're 13 years old if you're in the 99th percentile because that means you're the very high performing. So 50th percentile means you're right where you're supposed to be on grade level. Percentiles are kind of the ranking of where you are uh, in your performance. So this is our achievement and this is 2014-15 and all the way to 2016-17. So you can see as you go through the grade levels the increases that we're seeing in our achievement on that common measure and getting all in that range of uh, on grade level for the elementary grades. And here's our secondary, same thing. The goal is to get between that 35th percentile to the uh, 75th percentile would be you're right in that on grade level range. The 50th percentile is you are absolutely solidly on grade level, but you can see the increases in seventh grade going from the 23rd percentile to the 35th. These are the trajectories that we pay attention to to make sure that we're improving year to year. If we keep doing this, we eventually will get to the 80% of the report card. Uh, here's our math improvements. Same thing in terms of elementary. Not quite as big a gains, but still gains over that time period. And here's our secondary math improvements. So this is what we know is consistent data year after year after year. Uh, and finally, our students meeting their individual growth. We track every single student in the district to see if Mr. Miller here, wherever he was, even if he's three grade levels behind, we have a growth target specifically for you, unique to you, and we have a different one uh, for Reverend Walker. And we also track whether students are meeting their own individual targets. And this is the, it, in the past, it was that 43% uh, in 13, 14, and we've gotten it all the way up to 60% of individual students are hitting their target for their own growth. Okay, and in math, the same, similar. For my team, this is the data that makes <laughs> a difference in our lives. This is when we know we keep making that steady improvement. And this is finally the, the good news of the uh, reading improvement plans, the 99% uh, reading improvement. Those are the numbers of how many third grade students we've promoted. And you can see it increases over the time, the number of students who have been able to move on to fourth grade. So next steps. Uh, Thursday, the state will post the report cards. The way they do this is early in the morning, uh, Mr. James will get a spreadsheet that shows everybody's performance across the entire state. Every district, he'll get a massive, massive spreadsheet because the reporters on Thursday will call him as soon as the web goes live and say, what do you think about how Toledo did, or Yosa did, or Elyria did, or whatever? And he'll be able to have that spreadsheet in front of him to answer that question. One hour later, he only gets one hour to review that spreadsheet, <laughs> uh, because the spreadsheet then is released to the media, and then one hour after that, the ODE website goes live. Um, from there, we then analyze the state data to look at statewide trends, and then we usually provide you later um, over the next two to four weeks uh, a summary that shows how we did uh, compared to the Big Eight, how we did to the Summit County, and we'll provide you that information. And then we also do the building by building analysis against the state uh, criteria. Uh, and then we keep focused on the work. Uh, this is the most important piece of all this is we feel real good about what we're focusing on 
and how that will keep this progress moving forward. And you'll notice now that all of these are really a pre-K through 12 kind of implementation. Any final questions? I know that's a lot of information with the graduation in, but go ahead. When when do scores go to parents for individual students, and when will they see those results? Is that after all of this? Do they get those released? And do this, and then the follow-up to that would be the students that are in that class of 2018 who need these extra. Do they know already, and and or when when are they going to find out? Yeah. Why don't you first talk about the rollout of the for yeah, the class so, of 2018? Yeah, class of 2018, last year, spring of their junior year, actually winter, second semester, they received a letter with their points, with their credits, and the things they needed to retake and do. And then they signed up for summer school prep and to do retakes in the summer, and they'll receive another letter after the December retakes to know where they stand. So their next retake, we just finished the retake, we just got the scores back today. today. And we're going through that right now, and then we'll send a letter to let them know who needs to do the retake for December. So, yeah. And explain the rollout of the information for parents and students on the, the new nine alternative uh, options. For them. Yes, that's that will be each building individually. Um, now that they have their assures and everything's finalized, and state's not going to make any changes, they'll start as early as summer, ready to go tomorrow to uh, meet with parents uh, and um, students. Uh, about the new requirements, and then they'll have the Howard Department has this profile sheet. It'll give the points. It'll give the students credits. It'll say what credits they're lacking, what tests they still need to retake, and they'll receive that, and you know, um, sign up for interventions and things of that nature. So. How are we doing that notification? Because I know right now the platforms that we have to do everything on is everything from basically smoke signals to, you know, hand tapping somebody on the back and saying, come to this meeting. The, the gambit is huge. How are we notifying those parents, hey, you need to come in because your child is in danger of failing if they don't do one of these wonderful things that are set up by, how are we letting them know that? Because that is one of well, the Well, some, some buildings, things. I mean, and it's, it's different for each building, but the majority of the buildings, when we had the uh, staggered start, so mm -hmm. first two days of school, we just had freshmen come. Right. They met with the individual seniors okay. that were in trouble. They called them in. They gave them their profile, gave them their plan. Um, but it's mostly individual contacts. Okay. Okay. Um, so one of the stopgap measures that we're doing is the capstone project uh, alternative where actually anyone, any student who's at risk of not earning the 18 points and doesn't look on track based on the profile that Mr. Lawson's putting together, they will automatically be put into a capstone project. So that's a non-negotiable. That's not, we're not choosing, we're not saying, hey, you can go take into this. their schedule. It's automatically going into their schedule, either as an independent study that's monitored by staff or uh, an actual course. However, the principals work that in based on the student schedule. And then in that course, we're building in the 120 service learning hours. So we're not, we're not, if this isn't going to be, oh, please come take mm -hmm. advantage of the nine right. options. Yeah. We're just building it in. You are going to meet two of these nine options. Like our if you're interventions. If you're, right. on, if you're at risk in eighth grade, you're right. put into whatever. Yeah. We're not about choice right. when it comes to graduation. You're going to pass. Right. We just build it right in. And how does the state let us know what our kids' scores are? I don't think we've gotten them yet this year, have we? For the spring test yeah, results? Spring test. Yes. They yeah. came back June 28th. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they went, and summer results are just coming Come back in. now, so those will go. They are very difficult to read on PAC. Yes. I go on there, and yeah. I know what I'm looking for, yeah. and I'm looking at it going, I can't tell what yeah. score he got. Yeah. I have no any, idea. If yeah. any parent, and you can communicate this, if any parent wants 
help interpreting. They can contact my office, they can contact Mr. Harrington, the testing office, and someone will talk through their results. Mr. We can also can show me before you yes, leave. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and Lisa, sure the one thing that you're seeing that we have to, you know, the state sends out points. Right. So they'll say your kids scored a 695. Right. So we know that a 700 is, you know, you know the first right. point for proficient. And we have to make sure that our parents, they get that conversion chart of, uh, from 700 to a 5 to a 4 to a 3 to a 2. All right. I have just a couple yeah. questions. Uh, I noticed one on the, on the uh, report there showed that uh, our kids around 8th grade, they start dropping in, in, in a lot of areas. Is there any indicators why they're dropping or uh, what we can do to help them at that point? It seemed like everything, all the numbers went down in 8th grade. Yeah. We actually believe it's more uh, of the movement that's coming behind them because all of the interventions and the intensity of our work where we're seeing more and more elementary students ending on grade level, where that every year those kids move up and so their scores are improving, the achievement scores. So this 8th through 12th grade group is sort of that last group that will go and each year behind them it's increasing um, as we go through. 8th grade is also a year, I mean, if you add on to the other fact that 8th grade is where you transition to more rigorous content, uh, students are starting to, it, to increase their level of independence in their academics, so that also is a factor. But what we're seeing trend-wise is our students every single year coming up, we have more and more kids reading on grade level and performing on grade level. But it, we still have that 8th through 12th grade group that's continuing through. Does so that make Alexander, sense? That, that's why we've started the Path to High School Success Program. This is our, we'll be going into our third year because we noticed that same trend. So students coming out of 8th grade, they go to a four-week program um, and, and to focus on math and English um, and how to, you know, collaboratively in, interact with one another um, before they enter ninth grade. So to try to, you know, take away some of that. Yeah. Actually, when, I was, when I was listening, it sounded like they're doing well down here in seven or six, that they should still be able to do it or they're doing improvement. They should improve in the eighth grade, but it seems like they're dropping in there. So something that's going on with it, it's causing them to drop. In that, in that area, in that, that grade level versus continuing to move up. So I believe yeah. if we can get them moved up, that would, that would be great. Well, for my son, it was just him feeling himself. You should have called me. And then my other question, um, in the area of, of uh, student success, why did we drop in that area, preparing them for success? Uh, did they, was there any indicators there that why we were... Uh, prepared for success, we're actually the same uh, level of percentage of students meeting remediation free score in the ACT. The state actually changed the, that's one of the indicators that changed where they increased the percentage needed to score on the prepared for success. If it hadn't, if they hadn't increased the indicator, the percentage, we would have maintained the same level as we were last year. So it dropped because the measure went up. Our, our performance pretty much stayed the same across those uh, indicators. Thank you. All right. Oh, yes. Do we have, I have a weird question, but I guess, do we have anybody in the district that loves statistics enough that they've played around with, um, at some point this, you, you can keep doing the bar and there's going to be diminishing returns somewhere. I mean, uh, you can only raise the bar so much, I guess, is, you know, if you're the state. Yeah. At some point, you kind of reach the limit on how much you can get into that 12 or 13 year period uh, for education. But anyway, we, the bar's here. Assuming it stays somewhere here, we're already at 80, even if they took it to or under it. Yeah. it there's still only the deltas right here, right? Mm -hmm. So, and our math scores keep showing that we're increasing year over year. Has anybody played with, just out of curiosity, well, assuming that we don't go beyond even this delta here, yeah. but we keep doing this, 
we're going to hit the state's targets in 2022 or something. So you're really asking, will it happen before I retire? Because <laughs> <laughs> it has to before I retire. I'm, I don't think I can retire until that happens. Right. How many years? Uh, <laughs> right. We No, we haven't looked at the exact number of years now that things are, are hopefully stabilizing in the system. But we can do that. We actually work real closely with Summit Education Initiative, and they do a lot of those predictive analytics. So we can ask them to, to map that out and come back and show us for each grade level almost what how many years will it take us based on the trajectory that we have. Because it would be, I mean, I bet it started at some point when the bar was first moved. Well, it'll take you five years to get there. Right. And then they moved it again, and even if they moved it, and doubled or you know, the increase in the, in the bar. Yeah. It might, because we're moving up, maybe instead of 10, it became well, it's going to take you seven or eight years. Right. And they kept moving up, and I'm sure we've added years, but at some point that has to start going yeah. back the other way. Yeah, and in so. my first uh, 15 to 20 years in administration, it used to be that it, the bar would raise every three to five years. So they would take you three to five years, and then they would raise it. But now that they don't do that anymore, now it just keeps on moving. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for the presentation. Um, definitely good to see all the work we're doing and, I, and, and the map results, too. I appreciate that. All right. Approval of meeting minutes for the regular meeting of August 28, 2017. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Do we have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? Hearing none, roll call, please. Uh, Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Otterman? Yes. Reverend Walker? Yes. And I did forget that I was going to mention on Debbie's behalf because we talked about it, so that no one thought she just got up because of your data or anything. <laughs> she did have a work commitment tonight, so she came as long as she could. So, um, superintendent's recommendations. Um, <clears throat> Mr. President, I have before me for your consideration 49 personnel recommendations. Um, these recommendations are in proper form, and I move their approval. However, I would like Kathy McVay to introduce a couple of people who are here in the audience who are um, subject to a couple of these recommendations. Thank you. Christy Campbell, if you could stand, please. I'd like to introduce to you tonight Christy Campbell. She is a uh, graduate of Southeast High School following which she went to Kent State University to pursue a degree in education. She fulfilled those requirements and earned her Bachelor of Science in Education in 2000, and then she earned her Master's degree in Education in 2016. She was hired by our, by our schools in 2001 to be an elementary teacher. Her first assignment was at Glover, teaching the fifth grade. From the elementary grades, she made the move to middle school in 2004 and taught a variety of subjects, including language arts, math, and social studies at Innes Middle School. A career move occurred in 2014 when she was promoted to a dean of students at North High School. She's being recommended tonight for the assistant principal position at North High School. Thank you. I just want, I'm so excited to continue our work at North High School with our college and career academies. And I look forward to seeing the benefits of that work for both our students and our community. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce to you Beth Winter from <coughs> Stanford's. Beth Winter is a product of Afro Public Schools, having graduated from Elk High School. And she went on to study at the University of Akron, where she received her Bachelor's of Arts degree and then her Master of Arts degree in 1992. The focus of her studies was in the field of communications. Her experience is quite extensive. She was Director of Public Relations and Marketing for Wadsworth Whitman Hospital, Regional Marketing Manager for Summa Health System, and a regional, regional vice president for the Business Volunteers Unlimited. Since 1984, she has also been associated with the University of Akron as a member of the faculty as a senior lecturer. Tonight, she's being recommended for a coordinator of partner engagement position working with our college and career academies. Congratulations. Thank you very much. 
this is an excellent opportunity, an incredibly innovative program, and I'm thrilled. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And then I believe Mr. Pendleton has one introduction that you Tara would like Ingram, to make. Could you stand? I'd like to introduce Tara Ingram to our payroll department. Uh, as you know, we've had a lot of transition in the payroll department. We've been operating with the temp for about three to four months. And this process is pretty extensive, and the candidate pool is really slim. So we're really excited that you're joining the team. Tara comes to us from out of state, moving into Akron. Uh, with experience in accounting and finance, internal auditing, and payroll. So we welcome Tara to the team. All right, do we have a motion? So oh, yeah, I, have a, I have a comment I just wanted to make. Okay. Um, can we do oh, a motion? Can we do this? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm I'll sorry. second. There's a motion and a um, I just want to look at the retirees that we have here, and uh, all of them are, are good employees. But I wanted to highlight one who I've worked with a, a number of years throughout the district. Uh, Nancy Rich is going to be leaving, and uh, she's a dedicated uh, uh, person, really loves the kids. Up, I said, seen her in action a number of years, and uh, I know the parents and the students at Glover are going to really miss her uh, there. So uh, I would like to wish all of them. Uh, if they have a happy uh, retirement, uh, enjoy their retirement, uh, and we will miss them all. Thank you. Beat me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. If, if we could, if we could uh, transfer whatever makes her run like the Energizer yes. Bunny and put it into all of us, we would yes. be all served well. And um, her energy is not matched by her size because right. she's pint size and fun size, if you will, and just um, uh, just a dynamo. I did ask, do, do, do we know how many years? Do you know how many years Nancy has? I know it's over 30, but I don't know. I'm glad you said something. I'll, I'll echo that, so. Any other questions or comments on personnel report? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Otterman? Yes. Grandma Walker? Yes. Uh, next, Mr. President, I have before me for your consideration one motion and seven resolutions on the consent agenda. These recommendations are in proper form, and I move their approval. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second on the consent agenda. Any questions or discussion? I do have a couple. And this is, I have a couple of comments and questions uh, on item number one. And this is something that people have been asked uh, probably in the last month or so uh, about the change that we have and the individuals that may come in from Cuyahoga County to uh, go in downstairs to uh, uh, have our hearings. Uh, they were concerned and wondering where those any of those individuals be someone that would they will be hired from the city of Akron uh, uh, and work maybe for through Cuyahoga County or are all of them going to come from Cuyahoga County uh, the other aspect of that they were people were asking is uh, uh, will any of them be African-American uh, individual that was brought in and then the last piece uh, they were just asking and this is I, and I couldn't answer this any of the questions really but um, they're asking if it's somebody who's coming out of another county, are they going to really be concerned about our kids versus someone who's in the community or in our county? So those, that was just something that I, and I, I'm bringing it out so I can complete my promise that I would ask the questions uh, there. And then the, uh, on items three, five, and six, uh, I uh, want to thank the LeBron James Foundation because they do a lot with our extended learning program. Uh, Mayor Horgan in the city of Akron who does our after school program in Century 21 that does our extended day and extended year program, and all the others that, that, that uh, help us here with our, our um, kids in the district. But these individuals, these groups, organizations seem to do this on a regular basis, and I think the monies that they give uh, allows us to do a lot with our students. So that was the comment, and then the question on comment, uh, questions on. Mr. Mr. President, yeah, so um, Akron Public Schools is a member of the Cuyahoga County Educational Service Center, and we have been increasing the amount and number of different services that they're providing to us under a contract basis. So um, the person um, that the Cuyahoga County ESC is hiring 
who will be working with us is actually from uh, uh, works in Summit County or worked in Summit County uh, at another school district. Um, actually, I believe has a PhD in psychology and has worked in a student services department. And it was an effort to really make sure that we have a truly impartial uh, hearing officer, which we are required to have um, by statute. And um, uh, this person will actually handle all of our hearings. Um, as you know, at the last board meeting, we had uh, Mr. Rambler, who's director of student services, listed as uh, uh, one of our hearing officers. But this uh, service will be the primary uh, person uh, doing the hearings. And I do not believe this person is African American. We just look for the most qualified person for the position and did have input into that process through the ESC. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the consent agenda? Hearing none, roll call please. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Manfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Otterman? Yes. Mr. Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. And finally, Mr. President, I have before me for your consideration 11 business affairs recommendations. These recommendations are in proper form, and I move their approval. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second on the business affairs recommendations. Any questions or comments? Sorry. Full of yeah. questions or comments. But on item number nine, nine, is that lift for the handicapped students or for handicapped and uh, or uh, so we can lift? heavy items that may not that be able to get. That's actually <laughs> so we can get to the ceilings and change light bulbs. Oh. It's that, man, that type of man lift for service okay. at the school. Building. Great, okay. okay. I was thinking it was like a, so it's a scaffold lift. Okay, got it. Thank you. I just, uh, I had asked a question earlier about uh, number 11 on business affairs and uh, Dr. Williams Woods clarified it for me. The two hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars is not just pure salary for two individuals. That's all the materials and everything needed for uh, those two positions and helping children on one-on-one -on -one and group uh, tutoring. So uh, it's not just salary. Just to point that out. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on business affairs? Hearing none, roll call please. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Otterman? Yes. Reverend Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Superintendent's report? Um, just to add a little bit more information to what Dr. McWilliams Woods uh, stated earlier about um, a visit to Columbus tomorrow, I am going with uh, Cheryl Carrier from Ford Next Generation Learning. Um, to meet with the state superintendent at 8 o'clock in the morning, so I got to get out of here real early, so we need to be done so I can go to bed. Um, <laughs> and uh, then a meeting with the governor's uh, educational policy staff, and then finally in the afternoon at 1, a presentation to the uh, governor's workforce uh, transformation board. Right, it's Akron, I believe, Mary and City and one other school district are presenting and of course we're presenting our college and career academy work. I already gave my report, treasurer's report. No report. Committee reports, are there any? No legal. No legal. And, uh, no. Instructional policy and student achievement. Maybe a break last time. All right, so we have one important update tonight. As all of you know, this, uh, the, all the high schools in the city have been hosting community and, and faculty design team meetings all summer um, to create recommendations for the superintendent and the boards in terms of what types of college and career pathways they would like to see in their high schools. And I know quite a few of you were able to go out and we had quite a few um, community members as those were held throughout the summer. The design teams were open to all community members, parents, students, staff, and we had a great representation across all the high school communities. Design teams did the following work over numerous sessions. They reviewed and analyzed the following. They uh, looked at student interest, parent surveys, current career, tech, and education pathways that we already have in the district, student enrollment data to determine the number of pathways each high school could have and support, 
and current workforce high demand, high wage data. We've talked a lot about those things as we've gone forward. Finally, the design teams cr created a proposal that was submitted to the superintendent and staff. We were um, kept informed as we went along by Rachel Tecca and Dr. McWilliams Woods. Tonight, what we're going to distribute is those recommendations based on the community and faculty input. I'm going to stress this. I'm going to stress it more than once. These are not the final recommendations. I say again, these are not the final recommendations. This is a summary of the community meetings and staff input. So the next step is to have the staff work through the staffing implications of these recommendations and bring back to instructional policy to the Finance Committee and to the Board the financial implications on moving forward with the maximum number of pathways listed on the chart, and you'll see those when you look. At our Board Retreat, that's next uh, Monday morning at 7.30, Ms. Tecca, um, Dr. McWilliams-Woods, and the Superintendent will step us through each of the school's recommendations and the rationale for each pathway listed. But tonight, we want you to see the first draft so you can begin to review it. Uh, Dr. McWilliams Woods will also send out additional documents for you to review prior to that board retreat on the 18th. So again, this is the draft for you to look at. So you can take a gander at that. If you have any questions about uh, what's presented here, um, stop Ellen on the way out. Talk to Debbie or myself or Patrick was at this meeting when we reviewed this. Um, or feel free to, to give Ellen a call or email. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for the Instructional Policy and Student Achievement Committee? Hearing none, no unfinished or new business, but we do have need to recess into executive session. Um, I do have one under unfinished business. It's a minor question. Uh, uh, last week, uh, I asked information in reference to the master's cohort group, and we got this year's group, and I was looking for uh, maybe five or six years so we can look at the, the data, because I, just looking at this year's data really doesn't give you any indication of the, what, what we were asking for at the last meeting, so I just want to make sure we can get that. All I of think us. Mr. Miller was going to email and was actually going to ask a similar question, so I think they're pulling together okay. that info for you. Got it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. We'll stay on top of that. All right. Pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22 G1 to discuss the compensation of a public employee or official of the school district and 121.22 G2 to consider the purchase or sale of property. Um, I'm requesting a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments before we vote? Roll call, please. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Otterman? Yes. Trevor Walker? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes.